I would like to introduce Dr. Pauline Yerkov. Um, her discussion will be on assessing pain in small laboratory rodents to improve animal welfare. And Dr. Yerkov studied biology with a focus on zoology in Germany and obtained her PhD in neuroscience at the University of Zurich, Switzerland, and had a master's of advanced studies in management, technology, and economics at the ETH Zurich, Switzerland. Her scientific field of interest is in the implementation and evaluation of severity assessment tools and the reliable assessment and treatment of pain in laboratory rodents. Currently, she works as a 3Rs coordinator at the Department of Animal Welfare and the 3Rs of the University of Zurich. She is the chair of the executive board of the Swiss 3R Competence Center and board member of the Swiss Society for Laboratory Animal Science. Thank you. And now I'd like to hand the presentation over to Dr. Yerkov. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, um, Paul promised that I will talk about analgesia. This is not the case. I'm going to talk about assessing pain in small laboratory rodents. And especially I will focus on those indicators and methods that have not been touched by Matt Leach uh, before. So I will, I will talk about grooming scales because they are important, but I will give you also other examples. And I will do something that Matt also started. I will discuss a little bit about the suitability, the validity of these indicators that we have for small lab rodents. And if I talk about lab rodents, um, I mainly talk about mice, but there are also some red examples. So the first thing I want to highlight um, is if you want to implement a meaningful pain assessment, which is of course a prerequisite for every kind of good pain management scheme, uh, we have to keep in mind that there is no one size fits all approach. When I see publications, when I see protocols of research groups at my university, what I often see are very generic score sheets, score sheets that are probably copy and pasted uh, from one method, from one experiment to another. And I would highly, highly recommend to not do these things because um, specific procedures and models, of course, will lead to different outcomes and will lead to different pain states that then will lead to very different pain behaviors. Um, we already heard today about the impact of not only species, which is a no brainer, but also line uh, of, of mice, for example. So re, um, different strains, age, sex, housing conditions, and also the handling method, which all have a huge impact on how animals perceive pain, but also on how animals will show pain. This is especially true for these small prey animals. And additionally, a recommendation of, my, of mine, do not delete your pain scoring with too many general or irre irrelevant indicators. And this is something um, that you see very, very often in the, in the literature. Our mice looked fine. They, run, they ran around, they did not lose any weight, so they probably didn't have pain, right? But I want to challenge that a bit and I will give you one example from our lab. Um, so this is data from female black six mice that underwent laboratory. This is a control group. Here you have two groups that just received analgesia, nothing else. Here you have a group that underwent surgery without pain treatment, and here two groups that underwent surgery with pain treatment. And these, and here we show body weight changes after these procedures, right? And what you directly see is these very, I mean, this the body weight is probably a very generic, very often used indicator. And yes, there might be severe pain states where we have a reduction of body weight that is measurable and that can be an indicator of pain that should be treated. But in many cases, we see things like this. If you have more mild to moderate procedures and a laboratory is probably not a mild procedure, right? But at least maybe a moderate, moderate procedure. You see that these very generic parameters very often do not attack the actual problem that is pain, is at least not fast enough. Here data from the same study, same animals, but a different way to assessing pain. In this case, it's a composite score uh, where we combined pain specific signs and especially abdominal pain specific signs. And you already see that this is a good tool to detect those groups that would suffer from pain. Um, so what I want to say with this, uh, don't discard all these traditional parameters, but 
take them with care, right? Many of them are more suited for very severe health states and not very useful for assessing mild to moderate pain. Um, and that is also pain that we want to treat, of course, when we want to assess pain in our experimental animals. So how do you start with a, planning a good pain assessment scheme? Um, ideally, you would design for a mouse or red. I, I would always recommend to design a score sheet. But what goes into the score sheet? Well, actually, the first thing you have to ask yourself is what actually happens to my animal? So which kind of pain type do I expect? Which kind of severity of pain which kind of which duration of pain do I expect? Because this will give you um, uh, this will give you an insight um, on the, the 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 most suitable indicators actually, and this will also give you like pain type and all this gives you very important information on what kind of measures you could take then to ease this pain, which could be a certain type of rescue analgesia and so on. But it's not that trivial to find that information. Uh, sometimes you might just know that there is this. So now my talk is, my presentation is frozen. You have to be a little patient maybe, yeah. So it's not that trivial to find information on what how painful an actual procedure is for a mouse. Um, sometimes you are lucky and you will find publications on your very specific procedure that is super helpful. Uh, use these. Sometimes you just have the experience. Maybe you have to extrapolate from other species. But there are also very, very nice working party reports out there, expert information. And I can recommend all of these that you find on this, on this slide. Um, but if that is not available, if that is not possible to get these kind of information, I, you sometimes just have to perform a pilot experiment um, testing a new procedure, carefully monitoring all the potential indicators, doing a very careful documentation, and then deciding on those that are actually useful for assessing pain in your very specific model. What also has something to do with what can be expected is as soon as you choose an indicator, of course, you should be aware of the um, normal baseline. And Matt showed that nicely. There is a um, not in most mice strains, we have a baseline in the mouse grimace scale, for example, that is higher than zero. Um, so that is something you should know, but you should know also about the different, the sex differences and the potential line differences you could encounter and the expected variation of these behavior. For the mouse grimace scale, that's relatively low, the variation, which is a good thing for that tool. For many other, especially behavioral parameters, you will find quite, quite a individual variation and variability, and therefore you should be prepared for that when using these kind of methods or signs or indicators. Good pain assessment indicators should be evidence-based and scientifically validated, um, and, and especially they should be scientifically validated and proven to be meaningful in your specific procedure or condition. And we don't have that data for many different indicators, but we do have it for some. Um, and I bring you here an example of borrowing behavior. Borrowing behavior is a natural behavior of mice that is reduced in abdominal pain. That is something we know since many years because it has been shown in mouse laboratory, for example. And therefore, you could assume it is also reduced in other abdominal pain states. And it is, in fact, reduced in mouse coleostasis models. It's reduced in mouse DSS-induced colitis models. But it is not reduced in mouse colitis-associated colorectal cancer, for example. So you can not just assume that because it works in a certain model, it will also work in a comparable one. But if data is out there, use that. It is very valuable. Another thing that an indicator should have as a characteristic is robustness, especially if you want to compare your results with results of other labs um, or maybe between different um, procedures. If you want to do severity assessment in Europe, this is uh, um, legally binding to do severity assessment. You have to do the severity grading. Therefore, we need indicators that can be compared. Um, but robustness is most easily been assessed with, mild, with um, multi-center studies. And this is, of course, a lot of work, right? So we don't find a lot of this. For borrowing behavior, 
we do have very nice multi-center studies in rats showing that borrowing is a, or reduction of borrowing behavior is a very robust, indic um, robust indicator or robust test to assess pain in rats. Um, for mice, we, for example, performed one together with two other German labs um, in naive mice. So what you see here are just base, well, not baseline, but these are actually non-painful animals compared in three different labs. Um, this is again the mouse Grumman score baseline and then a few days of treatment with an opioid analgesic because we assumed that this might have an effect on several of the parameters we were testing. Um, so this is our control treatment actually. And what you see here is um, obviously the analgesic did not have a huge impact on the baseline of the Grimace scores, which is good, which makes it an even more robust indicator. And we had very comparable baseline data, very close to zero actually, um, in our black six females that were of course housed and handled and treated with common SOPs or protocols. So good result for the Grimace scale not so good result for another indicator. Again, here body weight scoring, so it's body weight changes. Again, you see three labs and you see this treatment phase with this lighter in this lighter area here in between. And what we see is that we do have a decrease of body weight just due to the energy treatment. Um, that could be expected, but it's something that of course has to be calculated in whenever you use these kind of parameters. Um, but you also see there's a huge variance between the labs. Making body weight changes actually a not very robust indicator if you want to compare that maybe between labs or between different groups or experiments. So if you find that data of this kind for this indicators you use, again, something that is very valuable and that will qualify an indicator for including it into your scoring. Pain indicators, of course, should be pain specific and pain sensitive. Also something Matt talked about. Sensitivity is about how many animals or how good you detect actually animals with pain, while specificity is about how, um, how, you, um, how good it is in avoiding fails positive, right? If we are honest, we don't have a really pain specific indicator or parameter for mice. That's just not existing. We have some that have some specificity, right? Uh, we have many that are quite sensitive and many that are not so sensitive like body weight change. Um, but when I have to choose because I cannot have both, I would always go with the sensitivity because I think it's rather uh, worse to have an animal that is suffering from pain but is not receiving pain treatment than having maybe some animals that receive pain treatment without having pain, right? If I anyhow plan to use analgesia in case pain occurs. So in the following, I will give you now some examples of different indicators, mainly behavioral ones, that I think are quite useful. Um, of course, nesting and burrowing is included, um, but also grooming I will talk about. And I will give a little bit in thoughts on um, how well they do. Uh, in regard to these prerequisites and how they are used. And I wanna start with something that is traditionally used a lot. So reduced grooming and therefore reduced fur conditioning, conditioning or condition is something that many people use in their score sheets, in their pain assessment, because the theory behind it is that animals in pain will reduce grooming and therefore will have a worse fur condition. And I brought one example here, which is using a fluorescent um, marker and then they observe uh, how fast the animals do clean their fur. And you see when in the graph that this is obviously working. So there's a decrease in grooming um, because this transfer score is changing um, after surgery compared to baseline. And grooming has been very useful in the past or reduced grooming and it has been uh, used in several conditions and it's also been named an iceberg, iceberg indicator. So something that has, that helps us to assess several things that could happen in an animal like reduced activity, functional impairment, a negative affective state, which could be pain um, in just one measurement. So very, really a very useful indicator. 
what I want is to, to um, um, mention that this is uh, also a very um, a two-sided uh, thing using grooming because uh, yes, there are severe pain states where grooming activity decreases, right? And that's a warning sign then. But we do have also a lot of more mild to moderate pain states where actually grooming could be increased. And we know this, especially from, from stress research. So we know that and mice or rats in stress do increase their grooming sometimes. And of course, we observe that after surgery when we use eye ointment or spray glue or whatever you use. Um, but we also see very nice examples, or very nice, we see examples that grooming is not just quantitatively changed, but qualitatively changed and can then be a very nice indicator of pain. And I brought you one graph here from, well, from the field of stress research, and you see that mice and rats actually do have a very fixed pattern of grooming, right? Starting um, here somewhere around the nose, then grooming the face, and then starting to groom the flanks. And here is a video by uh, Johnny Ruffin that he kindly provided to me showing this in reality. So a nice, healthy grooming pattern of a naive mouse without any pain, obviously. Um, if you see something like this, it's perfect, right? Probably no, no fear that there's any kind of reduced welfare or pain state. But in post especially post-surgically, you sometimes see things like this. And this is a video by Paul Flecknell uh, that he provided for me. And I, you see many pain signs, by the way, in this, in this video. This is a male mouse that underwent a vasectomy and has not received sufficient analgesia. And what you see is this mouse has a shiny coat, very good groomed, um, and it grooms a lot also during this very short um, video sequence that we see here. But the grooming is atypical. The animal directly directs the grooming activity towards the wound, the fresh surgical wound. And this is something we see in abdominal surgery all the time when analgesia is not sufficient. This increased attention towards the painful body part is something that can be a typical qualitative change of grooming behavior and that, should be, uh, that you should be aware of when assessing pain in small laboratory rodents. Uh, and I give you that example because um, I don't want to say there are these, that all these traditional indicators are bad, but sometimes the story is not just so easy, right? It's not a yes or no, it's just, it's not reduction or in increasement. It's sometimes really a change of qualitative, uh, of quality, pattern, frequency, and all these things. And this is something you might have also in other behavioral um, behavioral observations that you might want to use to assess the welfare of a small rodent. Other examples um, that I like to work with a lot are nest building and burrowing behavior. We heard already in the talk before, mice do build nests and they do build burrows. Same is true for rats. It's a spontaneous and it's a highly motivated behavior. We know they like to do that and they do that also in the lab. And we know that these two behaviors are actually reduced in negative states, especially in painful states. There are some drawbacks because um, Boring behavior. Um, this is what you see in the video here. So this spontaneous displacement of um, food pallets or gravel from artificial tunnels or artificial burrows um, is something where we have a really high level of activity under standard laboratory conditions, also under barren conditions, or maybe especially in barren conditions. So um, this might lead to the situation that even so there might be mild pain it is masked by this high motivation to an empty these tunnels. Um, for nest building, also that was mentioned before, uh, we have of course a very, very, very important thermoregulatory function in mice. And um, when you have conditions that not only are painful, but might also affect the thermoregulation of an animal. And um, this again might be masked. So normally we would expect a reduction in nest building with uh, painful states, but if there is another disease condition that might lead to increased nest building activity to keep the animals more warm, you might have actually a, a typical response. So that's my word of caution, but nevertheless, these behaviors are very 
useful, as I said it before, and rat sparring is um, a often used tool. Also in mice, it's used more and more often. Um, this is one example of a very old study of us. Uh, what you see here with the dots, this is the baseline. So as a high, there's a high burrowing activity in these black six mice. After laboratory, we see a significant de de delay of the onset of the behavior that we can then reinstall with giving analgesia up to a level that is um, comparable to what we have in the control groups with anesthesia or analgesia only. Uh, you see also that there is a remaining anesthesia effect, right? So anesthesia has a huge impact, especially on these more complex behaviors. But if you choose the behavior right, like um, and it, this works very nicely in burrowing, you can actually see um, the, the pain effect and then additionally the anesthesia effect. Nest building is much more often applied. It's, it's a very, very often used tools for many, many different research questions. Mainly it's used in mice. It's not so specific to pain assessment as um, burrowing, for example. Um, and it's not just exclusively used in mice, by the way. I brought you an example here. These pictures are actually from a paper using nest building in rats and nest building complexity scoring to assess the severity of different epilepsy models. So, and here we come already to the problem, right? Because nest building is used in so many different research fields and it works so nicely in, to, to answer many, many research questions. Um, it is obviously not very pain specific. Huh? And it, can, it might be very sensitive, but it's, it's affected by many, many external and internal factors. Therefore, um, you should use nest building in your rodent housing. You should use nest material in your rodent housing. So it is an indicator that comes for free. So they should have nest building material. They should build nests. So you can assess that without doing anything on top, but don't rely too much on it. It's more a rough welfare assessment tool, let, let us say like this, but pr promising and discussed repeatedly in the past years as a tool also for assessing pain. Um, but we don't have to rely on these very, very, let me say, um, unspecific methods. We can also, next to this Grummer scales, we can use also very procedure, sp procedure specific pain signs. And if we have that for our specific conditions, experiments, procedures, then we are really lucky. And I brought you two examples here. Um, and the first one is a behavior that you typically see in abdominal pain. These are male mice vasectomized, again, that video is from Paul. You see stress and press behavior, stretch and press behavior, sorry. Um, normally, you will not see that as, as pronounced as you see it in that video, uh, but in a more subtle form, that is something you observe very, very often also in when there is residual pain after ovarectomy, embryo transfer, hepatectomy, and all these things. They are comparable indicators or behavioral signs described also for rats. And if you're interested in that, I can highly recommend to check out the work that um, my colleagues from Newcastle University did. So Matt, Matt Leach, John Rohan, and um, Paul Flecken, and all the others that worked on these in the last years. That's something I use a lot because I worked with uh, laboratory in the past a lot. But if you have other models, there might be other procedure specific um, signs actually. And I want to share one of you that is something that occurs very often in joint, in painful, in, in conditions where animals have maybe painful joints or painful extremities. The example I brought to you here is ex, ex, actually from an osteotomy. So this is bone fracture pain, a female black six mouse. And when you take a look at the affected limb, you see um, the animal's limping, it's hopping a bit, it's, it drags its paw every time it moves. So we call that paw aversion, something you can, might also see in some neuropathies. And this is, again, a very nice addition to a more general pain assessment as you would do it, for example, with a mouse grimace score or maybe with other approaches. Uh, these are just some examples. For other procedures, there might be other 
procedure specific pain signs, but I can highly recommend to use these um, in, as I said, in combination with a more generic one, because this really helps you to assess every kind of pain, maybe not the most mildest one, because mice are quite good in um, not showing that, but at least those kind of pains that really should be considered with all that should be followed by analgesic treatment or additional analgesic treatment. I mentioned that in my abstract, and this is why I'm going to talk very shortly about this, but there were already some, some, um, some mentioning of these apparatus-based behavioral test paradigms for pain assessment. Of course, drug self-administration can be very interesting. That's for sure not something that is useful for routine assessments, but it is very interesting for basic research. Uh, also anxiety related tests because there might be a link between pain and anxiety and then preference and avoidance tests. I will show you an example in the next slide. Um, but I also wanted to mention cognitive judgment or attention bias tests um, because at least theoretically these tests that have been explained very nicely by the speakers before me. Um, at least theoretically, these tests could also be used in small rodents to assess painful states. Again, we have to be honest, they have not been, they have been proposed several times, but they have not, there, there are no publications to my knowledge on that at the moment. But of course, that could be of interest, especially in pain states that are lasting longer, because otherwise um, it probably will not um, fit with the training shadow of these cognitive bias tests. I, I promised one example. So this is actually, again, a publication from Newcastle um, showing how a preference might change in animals that, are no, that do suffer from bladder cancer. Bladder cancer obviously is a condition where it's very difficult to assess pain in mice. And what you see here are actually the preferences for a compartment that is linked with analgesic treatment, uh, which is there's a higher preference towards this compartment compared to compartments that are not linked with analgesia treatment. And this kind of increased preference is not seen in animals that do not suffer from bladder cancer, so not seen in control animals. So quite a, quite a sophisticated approach to test pain, but you see um, it works obviously, and therefore this could be also promising um, way to, to, to take a look more at these apparatus-based behavioral test paradigms, at least for basic pain research. One thing that whatever you choose is super important is to be aware of procedural side effects. Um, if you use behavioral indicators, this is important, but it's as important when you use physio physiological or clinical indicators. So many things you might do with an animal, especially things you might do with an animal when you do a painful procedure, might include substances that have any effect on many, many things like behavior and physio physiology. And I brought you two examples here. Um, this is about mouse activity and buprenorphine treatment. So here in the first row, you see actually a normal mouse circadian rhythm, so normal activity profile. Uh, below that, you see how buprenorphine increases activity in naive animals. This is a, um, and then you see here uh, in the last two rows, you see actually how activity is still increased uh, despite of surgery. So if you want to use an activity-based indicator for pain assessment, be aware of these kind of side effects. It doesn't have to be hyperlocomotion and hyperactivity as you see it here, but it could be also sedation. So these are things you have to know when deciding on the right indicator. And the same is true um, with other substances. I brought you here one example from a publication we just published just, just last month um, about um, how substances can influence actually the mouse grooming scale. And what you see here are naive animals that just received Dufalgan uh, in ch so Dufalgan children syrup, something that we use for smaller surgeries sometimes. And you see the pure treatment with Dufalgan led to orbital tightening, which is an action unit of the mouse grooming score, right? So um, 
this would actually disqualify the Grimace girl scale, at least in, in its completeness, to be implemented in this kind of procedures. Because if I already have these effect by the analgesia, of course, I will. It's very hard for me to, to see if this orbital tightening comes from pain or is just a side effect of my analgesia. And um, this, again, can be extrapolated to, to many other substances and procedures, handling procedures, animal care procedures, and so on. So these are things you have to, to think about before starting with your pain assessment. Circadian rhythm is another topic. I'm not going into detail. I think that's a no-brainer, of course, behavior and also physiological measurements are somehow related to a circadian rhythm. Um, but very shortly before I come to, to the end, um, I want to say something on automation of pain assessment because we see an, a, an increase of the of literature on automation of behavioral assessment. And this is, of course, super helpful also for pain assessment. Um, there are method there are software there is software out there that helps to detect changes in facial expression um, there are people working on automate automated recording of uh, ultrasonic vocalization which could be also a promising tool to assess pain activity body temperature and so on so i think that's probably the the future of pain assessment and especially in regard to physiological add to the combination of physiological and behavioral assessment and then, then that's actually my last slide. Um, when you did that, when you assessed pain in your model and it worked, right? <laughs> or maybe it didn't work, whatever. Do re-evaluate your scheme. Um, get rid of all those irrelevant indicators that have not been proven to be successful. Include new ones that have been published because they are more and more published all the time. People are working on these topics. Use your data to really improve analgesia. Um, energy regime, maybe even anesthesia regime, uh, and optimize termination criteria if that is needed, and publish it. Uh, we did, it's not published yet, <laughs> but we did a systematic review, for example, on the um, reporting of pain and welfare assessment methods, and in this case here in telemetry transponder implantation surgery, which is for sure very painful and very major surgery. And we found that even after the publication of the ARRIVE guidelines, for example, we had 80 to 90% of publications who did not report how or if they assessed pain in their animals. And I think uh, we can all do better because this information is very important for those who plan for the experiment and plan new procedures. Um, yeah, and with this, I'm going to finish um, my talk and I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Dr. Yerkoff. That was a really holistic and enlightening approach to assessing pain, and it really underscored the importance of customizing your pain scale.